Hey guys, welcome to part three. So in this part, we're gonna talk about the three stages of development for your business. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reference a website. I'll put the link to this website in the description of this video below. He does a great job breaking down these three sections. So I wanna make sure we go through it correctly. You start at infancy, then you progress to adolescence and then you get to maturity. So let's talk about infancy for a second. What does that mean? This is where most of you are gonna be starting. So the infancy stage is where the business operates on what the owner wants, that's you, rather than what the business needs to grow and succeed. You left your job because you knew the experience you wanted to provide. You know what you're looking for in terms of patient care, patient outcomes, the experience you're providing, and, and you've got this construct in your head which is unique and amazing and it needs to get out into the community, but understand that there's a limit to doing it all yourself. And so this stage ends, the, the stage of infancy ends when the owner can't keep up with the demand and the supply and the quality begins to drop. You're all gonna go through this. You will start and it will either rocket to the moon, just you'll get super busy super fast or it'll be slow. It'll be a slow grind process. But what's gonna happen at some point is you will build momentum. So when we started the practice, we were about a year in, we were doing great, patients were happy, clients were happy, we were growing our, our bank accounts. Second year, we were keeping up, we had two locations at that point. By the third year, we were running ourselves into the ground. There was no way we could keep up with the demand. It was snowballing. We had lots of money in the bank account, but who cares because we were literally getting into the clinic at 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. We weren't leaving until 8, 9 p.m. at night. And then we would come home and do extra work until we fell asleep. You know, nobody wants a lifestyle like that. Like that's not why you get into business. So we were at this point by about the third year. That, that was kind of the make it or break it point for us. Um, so let's see, infancy ends when the boss realizes things cannot continue the way that they have. If you're still only a technician, which that's, that was us, we were treating every patient, we were submitting every claim, we were answering every call, sending every fax, you know, we wore every hat in the organization, including I was cleaning the toilets, I was wiping down the mats, I was doing everything. If you're still only a clinician, this is where many people decide to walk away. And, and that's really where we were. We had gone to the point where we said, look, this is not sustainable. We weren't married, my partner and I, we married later. But the idea is we knew when we got married, when we were gonna get married and have a family, that was not the life we wanted. We wanted this to go from a crazy full-time job to a business that would allow my wife myself, the freedom and independence to step out of patient care and focus on what was important at that time, which is raising our children, being around family, having the experiences that we wanted to provide. We didn't need a bigger house. We didn't want a nicer car. We wanted freedom of time to raise a family. And so at that three year mark, that's where we said something needs to change. We, we just can't continue on like this. And so let's jump into the second stage of business development, which is adolescence. And in adolescence, the stage is where you've decided to let your business grow and it begins to reach outside your comfort zone. Uh, for the technician, it's more work than you're comfortable doing on your own. For the manager, it's more subordinates than you're comfortable managing. And for the entrepreneur, how many managers he or she can keep motivated to keep heading toward the goal and the vision for the business. That is where you're in the adolescent stage. Um, when you're in this stage, be careful not to fall into the trap of abdication. And so what does that mean? You'll hear me say, delegate responsibility, don't abdicate responsibility. I teach a course, it's a Medicare billing course. It teaches clinicians how to do their own billing. Now, I don't teach that course because everybody has to do their own billing. I teach that course because nobody 
should ever delegate, well, in this case, abdicate responsibility for collections when you don't understand how to do it yourself. You know, there's certain things that you're, you're just not gonna go out and learn, right? Like I'm not a certified public accountant. I'm not a CPA. I hire a CPA to do it. But I understand the basics of taxes and what's, what's a deduction, you know, what's a liability. Um, if I didn't understand that at all, then I am 100% abdicating responsibility and I lose control, right? Why do we do what we do as clinicians? We do it to build resilience, independence. We want our patients, for me, I want my patients to be able to walk and to be able to get off the ground if they fall. Are they falling every single day? No, but when it happens, I need them to be strong enough, healthy enough, able enough to get back up. And so that's what we're talking about here. Too often when a, a business owner, practice owner um, starts getting too busy, the first thing they do is they look to hire an individual before they've built the infrastructure to adequately train that individual, right? And, and you're, I know what you're thinking. You're like, I just need somebody to answer the phone. So you hire somebody, you say, answer the phone. They do it incorrectly, they do it to their best ability without training, without support. You're busy treating patients, so you don't have the time to bring them up to speed. And what happens is you get frustrated, they get frustrated, the job isn't done correctly, um, and you start to see more problems. The next step, you come back in and you start answering the phone for them and you start doing half their job. I see it all the time. So the whole idea in this, this adolescent stage is recognizing the pitfalls, understanding that you can't abdicate, you can't bring somebody in that you expect to do the job you want them to do without training them and providing the infrastructure for them to do it properly. So I'm gonna reread this one more time. When you're in this stage, be careful not to fall into the management uh, trap of abdication rather than delegation where you have people working under you and you start to remove yourself from the business. Often, the people you hire don't do the work to the level you want them to do it and you end up reverting back to the infancy stage where you're just doing everything. You see it consistently. If you expand beyond your comfort zone and increase your ability to handle the expansion, you'll enter the maturity stage. And so let's talk about this stage and I'm gonna share my experience with you and how our business developed. So the maturity phase means your business has a clear vision and a purpose. The owner must handle the entrepreneurial aspects of running the business by hiring managers to follow the vision of the company and the ma to manage the technicians who are actually doing the work. You are not supposed to work in your business, but rather work on your business. Figuring out exactly who your customers are, what you provide them, and where the value, where do you add value to their lives, to the customer's lives. When you have a mature business, you can really focus on creating the impact. And so this is just, it, it's such a great analogy to apply this to patient care. You know, that patient comes in with a persistent condition, right? Let's say they have shoulder pain, um, non-traumatic injury, just started to hurt. Three months ago, hasn't gotten better, stabilized, isn't getting worse. Now they're coming to you to help. What do you do? First thing you do is you do an evaluation. You identify the problems, contributing factors, complexities. You look at the whole landscape. You look at the resources the patient has available to them, the resources you have available to you, and you establish goals. Now you understand as a clinician, it's never a linear path. You're never gonna say, this is where we are today, this is where you're gonna be tomorrow, and we're gonna get straight there, right? It's always ups and downs and, and wobbles and moving around, but as long as you're always course correcting, you're gonna get to that goal. If you don't ever measure progress, you could end up in left field. But as long as you're paying attention, measuring progress, develop a, a, a plan of care, you're gonna get to the goal. And that's the way you are, you should treat your business. And so when you start at the infancy stage, you're doing everything, you're wearing every hat in the organization, you're doing every job. 
As you make the decision to progress toward the adolescent stage, you start to hire on. Now what we did, which I would say it's a mistake, but I want to kind of explain it. The first thing we did was we hired administrative assistants because we were in that mindset of we're the clinicians, we're the, the revenue generators. If we're not treating patients, there's no, no money coming in. I can't spend my time answering calls and checking insurance and doing all that stuff. So I'm going to hire somebody to do that. The problem is we're so busy with patient care. We don't have the time to adequately train the administrative individual. In retrospect, looking back at the way we should have done it, what we should have done was hired a clinician. Yes, it's a lot more money. Yes, one clinician might cost two or three times what an administrative person might cost. But the idea is, at least at the very basic level, if I hire on a clinician to replace me, that clinician has basic competencies. That clinician is gonna be able to provide some level of service that doesn't require my constant assistant and coaching. What that does, it allows me to step out of the clinical role for a breather. It allows me to do the job of the administrative person. I actually can focus on answering the phone. I can document the way I answer the phone. I re record multiple experiences. I can set objective measures to say, okay, when I answer the phone for a new patient, these are the criteria that I need to achieve. And, I, and the ultimate outcome of answering that call is I want this patient in my clinic within 48 hours of the initial contact. You know, I wanna make sure that I've got the benefits checked and they're 100% accurate every single time. I wanna make sure that I've completed the admission process for this patient over the phone. We've built some rapport and maybe I've completed, you know, this, this checklist of criteria for admission. Okay. Now, once I've done that job for however long it might take, a couple weeks, a couple months, now I've got recordings. I've got systems and policies and procedures. I've got documentation to determine success. Now I can hire somebody in as an administrative person. I can train that person, coach that person, get that person up to speed, and then I can step to the next role, you know? And, and maybe it's a back and forth. Maybe first I hire the clinician to replace me. I'd let them do what they do best. I develop the infrastructure for the administrative position. I hire and fill that role. Now I look at the clinician, I say, okay, you've done a good job, but let's make it better. And so now I go back to the clinician role and I start building out the systems, the processes. I see what that person does. I, I modify what needs to be modified. You know, at the end of the day, our business is a platform for success. It's a platform for your patient's success. It's a platform for your success. And it's a platform for your staff, your team members' success. And the better you build that platform, the more stable, the more secure, the more tools and resources that you have that contribute to their success, the better everybody does in the organization. Okay, so what we did, I, I said I would share my experience. We hired the admin. We went through lots and lots of challenges. Um, we finally realized that we needed to take the time to really build the platform for their success. Then we hired clinical staff to replace ourselves. We continued to grow. We opened multiple locations. We covered two states. And if we didn't make that change from infancy, where we do everything, to adolescence, where we start to delegate and not abdicate, we would never have reached maturity. It took us, I would say, about five to seven years before our business really hit what we would call a mature stage. We weren't looking to grow any longer. We weren't looking to do anything really different. We had consistent profitability, consistent revenue. All of our systems were in place. If somebody moved on from our organization, we had a system to bring in and train and bring up to speed a new recruit. We were stable. And I would say, you know, thankfully, we reached that goal at the time that my wife and I decided to get married and start a family. And so 
you know, we, we met our goals. My wife was home full time when we started having kids. She was able to raise our kids. She continued to work in the business from home. She would do payroll and credentialing and things like that. I maintained a presence in two of the five clinics that we were operating at the time. The rest of the clinics were running independently. And that brought us, you know, the, the financial stability we needed to focus on what was important at that stage, which was growing our family. Now, in the next video, we're gonna take a look at some of the processes that we developed to ensure long-term success of the business, to make sure that the business wasn't dependent on me or my wife, that the business was in, uh, an entity that was capable of surviving away from us. Guys, I'll catch you in the next video.